So, we're going to take you back. I personally have always been fascinated at just how good pro footballers were at school. So was it very much a case of first we picked, everyone wants to be on your team? Was it a 10 goal a game in the playground or was it a bit of a in the background until you got a little bit older and then kicked on? No, I think it was pretty much straight away. Actually, I got sent um, a picture from one of my younger teammates when I was coming through the ranks. I started off at Barry Bluebirds when I was six and one of the, the parents there sent me a paper clip the other day, in the news, uh, obviously in the newspaper. And we must have won about 12 nil or something because I scored eight. <laughs> so I showed my son straight away. I said, look how good I was. <laughs> That's the benchmark. I had to boost my ego. But um, yeah, I think pretty much from the, the word go, I, from right way back, I, I can remember I was always, you know, pretty decent at football. And I was, even I was better than, you know, the older kids. My, I used to go out with my brother. He was maybe, you know, a lot older than me. And I was still better than the, the guys his age. So when you picked up at Bristol Youth how old were you when you first joined their youth setup so I was 10 when I got picked up um and I went on like supposed to be two weeks trial but after a few days they just said yeah we'll give you a contract and then pretty much you're fighting for a year two year contract from a young age during your time there were there any senior pros in the setup or anybody a bit higher up who like kind of took under their wing or was like a good role model or really like went around the youngsters and put their arm around them and things like that um, to be fair, it was a brilliant club. I think I really enjoyed my time there. I couldn't say anything bad about it. I think from the outside as well, everyone knows it's a good club. It's, it's run well. Um, and I think probably Brian Tinian, who gave me my debut when he was still playing, he took me under his wing a little bit. Um, I think because he always used to come watch the youth team games, so he's always had an interest, one eye on, on that side of that side of it. I used to look at Christian Roberts. I, was, I actually met him the other week. We've we stayed in touch since we both retired and um, we're quite close now. But when I was at Bristol City, I said, I used to look at you and you're another Welsh guy. I thought you were going to take me under your wing, but you literally just fucking sacked me off. <laughs> he, was, he was like, bro, I was like literally steaming every day. I didn't know what I was doing because he's obviously on a, he's recovering from, with alcoholism addiction as well, like me. And he's just like, I was off my nut every day. <laughs> I was like, okay, I'll let you off. So big chance came 30th of October. I've got a little bit of a mini quiz. Do you remember who it was against, final score, and who you come on for? Is this for what Wales? For, for, for Bristol, sorry. For so Bristol. Your, your first senior debut for Bristol. Was it against Colchester? Yes. Um, I don't remember the score, though. I was 16. Yep. It was nil-nil the score. Okay. Do you remember who you come on for? This is a tricky one. Scotty Murray? Michael Bell? Oh, okay. Yeah, that's strange. Cause I thought cause he's a left back as well, so that's pretty strange. Um, Going for the win then, clearly. Yeah, we were trying to. <laughs> clearly didn't make an impact, did I? I was waiting for you then to say, Michael Bell, who's he? <laughs> <laughs> I knew him as Mickey, but everyone used to call him Mickey Bell. I was thinking, fucking hell, who's that? No, but um, yeah, he was a good player, actually. Um, yeah, you really took your chance then after this debut. You, you never looked back, really, after that. Your first season, you played 57 games and scored seven goals. Um, and you won Young Player of the Season, and you also made your Wales debut, which is, you know, that's all right. You've had worse seasons, I bet. Um, how was that? It must have been, you know, a whirlwind for you at 17. Yeah, it was crazy. I think, to be quite honest, I had that kind of arrogance about me from a young age. I even felt that I should be playing the first team when I was 15. Yeah. I felt like I wasn't too far away from, I was always knocking on the door, I was scoring week in, week out. We were playing against Arsenal, you know, like Fabregas would be playing and, and so on. And we were always tested against very good players. Yeah. Um, and Bristol City were in League One at the time. And I thought, do you know what? I'm not too far away. But I think if you ask any footballer, you have to have that mentality to make yeah, to try. You always think you're better than you are anyway. But I think <laughs> um, I thought I, I had a real good chance because I was training with the first team when I was like 15 and, and so on. I was getting taken out of school. Um, and I, was always, I played for Wales, maybe under 21s when I was like 15, 16 as well. So I, I knew I was knocking on the door. Um, but then obviously to make my Welsh debut at such a young age and then coming on for my hero, which is obviously Ryan Giggs. I think most Welsh people growing up then was, was probably Giggs, he was their favourite player. Um, that was quite surreal. Yeah. I just remember watching, I literally just watched him eat, even eat soup when we were in the, in the camp. <laughs> I was like, just watched him, I think, how the fuck am I in the room? Did you start copying his technique? I tried soup. to copy everything, but then I just realised there's levels of the game that I could <laughs> keep up. Is that the significance of you taking the number 11 shirt then for Barry Town getting your... 
Yeah, so I've, I've pretty much always wore number 11 from like a young, early age. I, I was number 11 at Bristol City as well, and I always wanted to, that number just purely because of gigs, yeah. Right, right. Um, it wasn't then long after this that you became a Premier League player uh, with Wigan. Uh, came in for you bit for two million. We've been, you know, we've been told we fact checked it. Yeah. Wikipedia. Um, how do you find the step up to step up to the Premier League, both in terms of standard of opposition and also how Premier League clubs are run and you know the experience around that? Was there a a, a big step up? Yeah, I think it was a big step up. But I think with going away with Wales and training with, you know, at the you know, Craig Bellamy, Ryan Giggs and, you know, at the Premier League boys, Danny yeah. Gabadon, et cetera, at that time, I think that helped me um just bed in a little bit better. But I think the standard is a lot quicker. And yeah. it's and it's not um as forgiven as much as like League One championship. Mm. Don't get me wrong, championship is tough league. Um, but the jump from League One to the Premier League, you know, I've there's just no they just punish you. They just yeah. get one chance and they score, whereas like League One, you know, they get three or four chances and that's why players are in League One because they don't punish you as much as the Premier League. That's just, it's the best league in the world. Yeah. So you felt the step up then immediately being in, the, in that Wales setup? Yeah, I think so. I think um, not necessarily in the, in the Welsh squad, but definitely at Wigan, I felt like there was a huge step up. I think with Wales, there's no disrespect, but we had a very different range of players. We'd have, you know, Giggs, who was at Man United. Then we'd have someone who was at Wrexham. And it just didn't, mm. the, st the standards were just yeah. completely different. And um, hence why one of the questions I might be coming along or not, but I did have um, a falling out with John Tosh Toshak about that, is that he wanted all his players to be playing a higher level championship and Premier League. So then when I was in the Premier League, I was going away with Wales and I still get, no disrespect, but I still get someone who was playing in League Two or sometimes even Conference then playing in front of me. Yeah. And that's when I just lost my head because I just said that, well, you want us to grow as a country and do better, but then you're still picking the lesser players. And that's no disrespect to the players, but we are trying to grow as a country. And if you look at the Welsh squad now, they're pretty much championship and up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, first goal came at Upton Park in a 2-0 win. Um, I mean, it's a good place to get your first goal as well as a Premier League player. Um, that must have been, you know, when it must have been incredible first of all but then it must have been a hell of an atmosphere um it's quite a difficult place to get a result like how was how does it feel getting your first premier league goal something which i haven't as yet experienced yeah you still got a chance still time, time. Yeah. um yeah I, it was actually with my left foot as well i don't score many with my left foot but i um yeah it was it was surreal i think it was just before my not so long before my 18th birthday if i remember correctly maybe a bit after i'm not sure definitely around my 18th birthday so I always wanted to be in the Premier League and I always wanted to be seen on Match of the Day. That's yeah. something I always wanted. It was growing up thing. I want to be on Match of the Day. Um, so it managed to come earlier than I expected. I actually, before I signed for Wigan though, I signed for Norwich in the morning. Yeah. So our, uh, Norwich chief executive come down, mm. a deal was signed. I signed the contract, but my agent didn't obviously publish the papers to Norwich because he knew that a Premier League was coming in, a team was coming in. And then um, Bristol City... City's owner rung me and said, look, we've accepted another bid, blah, blah, blah. And that's when I flew up from, I was on away with Wales at the time and then I flew to Wigan to sign. Wow. Wow. Yeah. That's incredible. Like a yeah. drop of a hat sort of yeah, situation. Yeah, just like one minute I was going to So you didn't even see that coming? You, like, what happens in that situation? Are you told by the club or did you have an agent at the time that, where you were going? Because I take it you didn't have a say in it, right? Yeah, so Norwich, I could have chose obviously Norwich, but um, John Toshak wanted me to choose Norwich and I said, there's no way. Not many people are going to turn down a move to the Premier League team to go to the Championship. I just you're not going to, especially at that age. So, but he he actually um, he didn't like that too much, and he's kind of like if you went against him, he didn't really like that too much either. So um, I think I got up his nose a little bit with that move. So with with Toshak or like any any manager, how do you approach a manager in the right way if you have any sort of disagreement with them or don't agree with them? Because you. I suppose you have to be quite gentle in your approach, but you have to say, well, come on, this is how I actually feel. So is there a good way of doing it? Um, I think, well, my agent at the time was Cyril Regis, which is obviously yeah. a legend. He's an amazing person as well. He did a lot for me as a young person. I just, I didn't stay with the agency just because I felt they had too many players and I wasn't getting looked after. But from the point of view from him, he couldn't have done any more. He's an amazing guy. Um, and he always taught me from a very young age, if you're not happy with the manager, go and knock on his door, whether you're... 16 or 32 mm. you just go and knock on the door and that's what i did i'd sometimes take the approach but i wouldn't take i try not to take bullshit either i think that's what <laughs> didn't help my career is that i didn't 
some people know how to play the game a lot better than me. Then they get a year contract, two years. And you look at players, you think, how is he getting a year, two contract, year, two years? Because they just play the game better, and I just couldn't do it. I just when anyone was getting on my nose, I'd fucking soon let them know that I'm not happy in the change rooms. And if we were losing matches, I would, I'd kick off. So it becomes political at that stage, and you just how you like you said how you play the game dictates like what what happens from there. I think that's like in most working environments. Absolutely, it, really? yeah. it's like you play the game, you get a, you yeah. stay on. <laughs> yeah, for sure. This is the second section, so we're going to delve deeper into the, the career. Yeah. Um, what we touched on with managers a little bit here, 2008, during your time at Wigan, you made a loan move to Sheffield United. We led a permanent led to a permanent deal. There are a lot of players who worked with Kevin Blackwell at the time, uh, and they said less positive things about him. He seems quite a, deci- a divisive character in there. Uh, how, how, was, how were you with working with Blackwell? He was actually good when I was on loan there. Um, I think it's because I left Wigan. I, was, I had no old school manager there with Paul Jewell and Steve Bruce obviously then come in as well. I think I, I can't remember if I was on loan. Yeah, I was on loan as well at Sheffield United when Steve Bruce came in. He was really, really good guy. Very good. I liked Steve Bruce. It's just I wasn't playing. I, had, um, I was playing in front of Antonio Valencia with Paul Jewell, but then Steve Bruce took over and then Valencia was playing a lot more than me. So I had, I was a young guy. I need to get out on loan because Toshag would say, look, you're not going to get in the Welsh squad unless you um, you know, play week in, week out. So I went on loan to Sheffield United. Blackwell was fine with me um, on loan. Everything was going really, really well. I loved my t- time there. Gary Speed took me under my wing because I was a young Welsh guy and he's obviously top man and a brilliant um, professional. And um, But then when I signed there on a permanent, it was just kind of like, he just like carried on at like the younger lads. It was kind of like, to be quite honest, I don't think it happened today because it's like a form of bullying the way he was, where he was go- went about his business. Um, and to- that's hence why I moved to to Swansea. To be honest, I don't, I didn't enjoy my football at that time towards the end. And it was a brilliant football club as well. I loved playing there, but he was just, he was just an arsehole towards the end. I wanted to get out of there as soon as possible. I didn't believe in his philosophy. He didn't I lost the respect for him as a person? So I need to get out. So. Like following on from that, that's that's fascinating because we were looking at that Sheffield United team in itself. There's some incredible players there, like you said, like Speed is there, Paddy Kenny, Chris Morgan, Lee Henry, uh, Weber, Hugo Ekiog, Gary G- Gary Cahill, Walker. Obviously, the championship is tough, but what do you think that the squad should have? Sh- do you think they should have gone up that season when you were there? Yeah, we had a, we had a wicked squad. I think we made the playoff final as well against Burnley. We lost one nil, but leading up to the I can't just blame her on that, but we lost James Beattie. He went to Stoke um, a few months before that in the January transfer window. I think if we had him in the final, we would have probably got promoted. I We were just missing a, a key striker um, because Beats was kind of like the guy which good goal scorers are. When you're up against it and you're having a shit game, they'll just go and score a goal and you win the game. Um, and he had that, and we missed that, I think, in the playoff final. We had all the we had like brilliant players. You know, Lee Hendry as well, um, he was unreal in training. And then we play in a game on the, on the weekends and then Blackwell would take his game away from him. You're just like, well, he's ripped the Premier League up. You then want him to do doggies up and down the pitch. And that's not him. He's like, he cuts people open. He's got great ability. He was just, honestly, he'd be ripping it up in training. He's one of the best trainers I've seen. And you've got then a, a manager who's never played at his level, trying to take it, his game out of him, what he's done for the last 10, 12 years in the Premier League. It's just... Them make sense. That to sounds so was, frustrating. Was, was there a style of football then that particularly affected it? Do you think as well? Like you said, it kind of took his game away from him. What was what was Blackwell's kind of f- football philosophy? Was he a bit of a long ball merchant? Or? Yeah, it was kind of like old school. Really, he didn't like us to get the ball down and pass it. Nowhere near like Sheffield United the way they're popping it around now. Mm-hmm. If you would have seen a, a centre back doing a, an overlap, he'd probably have a fit on the side. But he, um, yeah, we we didn't pass the ball, and that kind of. Um, baffled me a little bit because we had obviously Speedo in midfield who was a brilliant football player. We had Lee Hendry, we had loads of talented players there, Michael Tong and uh, and so on. And we just, and he, to be fair, all the players would moan about it, but we were winning so we couldn't do anything about it. Was there, I, I don't know how in, in terms of how approachable kind of he is, but is any of the senior players when they're not happy with a style of football or think something needs changing, would a senior pro either like approach him or speak to his office or was he a character that he thought, he's not going to listen yeah senior players would try but he i don't think he would necessarily listen um and we did have we as i say we made the playoff final so it's pretty hard to to moan about anything if you make mm. the playoff final you're doing something right to get there in the first place 
Um, but the senior players would moan. But that's that ha happens at all levels. You get senior players moaning, and or they go in and tell the manager. You're then putting your own head on the line because managers don't like that. They're like thinking, well, if he's causing the problems in the dressing room, we have a don't play him, or we get him out of the building, basically, because another team. That's how the politics kick in a lot. Cutthroat. Yeah. How much do you think his management affected? You know, you get into the playoff final, or do you just think it was you were a really talented squad of players? I think we were. No, we were. You know, he, he did get us really organised because um, when I first signed there, we had Brian Robson, who was our manager, and Brian Kidd was the assistant manager. Um, and so I joined on loan with, with Brian Robson initially. And I was only there for like two or three games and he mm. got the sack. So he came in and, you know, we were probably maybe trying to pass the ball before, so he knew that that didn't work. And, it, mm. and he, at that time, not many teams were getting promoted by passing the ball. It was always yeah. kind of like old school, keep it tight, blah, blah, blah. Um, so obviously he, he needs to take credit for it. I don't think his man management skills went down well with the majority of the group, mm -hmm. especially like the younger ones. It's well documented that you know most most players who played under him didn't really didn't really like him. So you just get used to managers being sacked as a player. Yeah, generally. Yeah, generally. Yeah, I it's think the way it is. It's even it. crazier now, where um, you know six seven months, whereas before they used to have like a year two years, but it's now just it's so. Um, cutthroat really it's, it's it's a ruthless business isn't it so how, sorry how, going back to um bt leaving it was a key player how much does the outgoing like that affect the squad so you know you've got big player maybe 20 lads in the team but when one big talisman goes how does that affect things confidence morale even when you're doing well so like you said is you to get to a championship final you're doing something right but like you said to get you over the line you needed him how much did that move kind of affect things yeah, I think, I think only looking back now that we, I would personally feel that it was a huge loss. Just be, not just because, um, well, the twenty thirty goals he was scoring a season in the championship, but he's like he was a huge character in the dressing room as well. He's like big bubbly character. He's always happy. He was always getting the lads together, and um, he was just great around the dressing room. From from the outside, though, a lot of people would look at him and think, you know, what an idiot he is. Blah blah blah. But he's such a nice guy. He was a really good guy. He was great for the dressing room. Everyone got on really well with him. Um, and yeah, it's huge. If you take 20, 30 goals out of your, any team, it's, it's a huge loss. And then if they're a big character as well, that's obviously a big part of the, the dressing room gone. I just don't think we did. We didn't replace them at all. Hmm. For the Swansea move in 2009, how was that being a Cardiff boy going to Swansea? And you were playing uh, under Brendan at the time when it was Brendan Rogers. So what, what was that like? Um, so I signed for Swansea initially on loan with Paulo Souza. He, I played a few games with him. I really, I liked, I liked it under Paolo because um, he had a great style of play. Um, but I just couldn't get my head around it. Now you see it more. But back then he was like, you'd have a good game. You think you come off the pitch, think fucking, I've ripped it up there today, and or you score, we'd win it. And then he changed the team the next day. You're like, wow. Mm. And it's really frustrating because you feel like you're getting going, and then he takes you out. Um, and I was always a player that I, every player wants to play, but some people took it a lot easier than others and I didn't really take it well when I wasn't playing. Was there any explanation as well? No, he just rotation. And you wouldn't get told like through through the tactics going over the game of anything positive or negative. He just not always, yeah, just put it up on the board, right, that's the starting team today and he wouldn't say anything about it and just expect it. To be fair, we had a great group there. Like the whole football club was littered with like very good people from, you know, the backroom staff to to literally, you know, the, we had a kit woman at the time who was really really good and, and blah, blah blah so we had like loads of good people right there um but yeah i think we just when he when he left we then kicked on there with Bre brendan rogers when he came in his philosophy i think his training is probably the best training i've ever come across in terms of the intensity everything was so organized every day the standard was ridiculous and we just kicked on as a football club was it clearly the next level from Sousa then having brendan rogers come in with this with this new vision yeah, I think it was just, Paolo was a very good manager as well. I think Brendan just come in and he was very, even from the first um, meeting we had with him, you just thought, fuck, we got a chance of getting promoted just because his his talk was just so good. And he was so, he's very detailed, very organised. His, his training is definitely the best I've come across in terms of the intensity. And I didn't actually have a falling out with him towards the end. I just, um, I missed two penalties back to back and I didn't see the pitch again. <laughs> But the only thing that I didn't like towards that is that I was then made to train with the kids and stuff on a Saturday, mm. and it's that just got my nose a little bit. Whereas, but in terms of him as a person and the, him as a manager, he's very, very good person and a very good manager. It's just um, sometimes it just doesn't work out for an individual at a football club. 
do you think you found found your groove then at, at Doncaster? Yeah, I think so. I think when I left Swansea, I signed for Barnsley initially for a few months. Didn't want to go. Um, hated the. I wouldn't say I necessarily hated the place. I just I was hate. I hated the headspace that I was in personally because I was mentally I wasn't in a good place. I was actually thinking about retiring before I went to Barnsley because I just fell out of love with the game when before when I left Swansea. Um, and I went there, and I just didn't like the management staff in terms of like little digs here and there and blah 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 and and some coaching staff they just don't like players who have pl- played at a higher level than them or they're a bigger name than them and they just then verbally attack you a little bit um and then i couldn't wait to play against this team again because i ripped her up and he's like oh, i always knew you had it blah 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 but you're <laughs> fucking playing with them when i was there uh, so yeah so when so then when i then i went i was a free agent and then dean saunders was the manager at doncaster he knew my ability because he was a coach at, with wales and he just said look just come and get me promoted i know you've got the ability to get back in the welsh squad and then um just love it again he said you won't be here long um I actually bumped into him not so long ago. What about over about two years ago? We went to Star Sixes in January. So that was when I was retired. He came as well. And I'm, me and Simon Church jumped on the plane with him. It's like six thirty. We were on there with all the the England players. I'm sat to, next to like Wayne Bridge, Luke Young, and 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 Joe Coles on there, etc. And Dean is just literally just swigging champagne. <laughs> he's above the law at six thirty in the morning. We're obsessed with Dean Saunders and I, how, honestly, how, he's, how he's been and his his tongue that he's got. He just Honestly, he's got no chill, right? So we'd be no like, filter doesn't see me. No filter. We'd be going on. So on a Friday, we would be playing um, games. He'd join in, blah blah. And you had to pick the the best trainer, the wor- uh, the best trainer, the worst trainer. He would always pick the, those ones. So best trainer one day, he literally had a horse. A horse walked in. He said, "Right, you got stakes and a horse now." <laughs> nice. And then the <laughs> next day, it was like the next week, it was like a brand new TV comes in for the lads. But on the Friday, we'd be traveling away on a game and he'd literally grab a microphone like this, be on the bus. And he'd be like, right, um, one of the players like James Coppinger, eight out of ten. Or he'd say to them, the next lad, four out of ten. I don't know what the fuck you're playing tomorrow. <laughs> like, literally, you want to give a player confidence, you say any shit the day before. But I love my time with Dino. I, I think when he went to Wolves as well, he tried signing me. Um, and it's just, it's a shame, really, because sometimes managers go and I was ready for that step up. And Wolves is obviously a brilliant club. And I thought, yeah, I'm ready for the move. I did what I need to do there. Um, it just didn't work out that well for him there. Um, I just think, obviously, you had bigger characters. And when you're, you know, coming for a few lads who take it. But then when you get senior players who played at a high level as well, they just tell you to just do one. That's an incredible insight to, to, to do know that. Honestly, I loved it. Unreal. I lo- I, honestly, I, I enjoyed him. His pants I, I got a lot of time for, yeah. I got a lot of time for him. When he once said, when United signed Lukaku, and he said they should have signed Jermaine Defoe instead. And it was like, really, Dean? And he was adamant. He was like, nah, Jermaine Defoe would have been better. He's like, 36, Dean. No, honestly, sometimes I just think, the pundits just think, right, what grenade can I throw to then trend on Twitter to stay re- stay like relevant? Every time my blood runs cold, sometimes when I said Dean Saunders is trending, like we've got a group chat and it was Dean Saunders is trending. What's he said? <laughs> know, he's, he's class, isn't it? To be fair, I used to, he was unbelievable in training as well. When he used to do finishing drills and things, he was just like insane, just like whipping him top bins and he's doing this and doing that. And it never it, goes. No, it never goes. Just obviously the pace goes, but his technique didn't. And he'd like drilling into some place, like, can't play with you, you're not on my level. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it leads us on to Birmingham. Um, would you say that was the best time you spent at, at, a, at a at a pro club at the time? You really seemed to get going there. Uh, what enabled you to, do you think you played your best football at Birmingham? I think Doncaster probably gave me the the um, experience and um, I'd say confidence again to get back in the, because I was then back in the Welsh squad. And I knew, I always knew that I was good enough. I just needed that arm around me just to get going again because I you know, I took a few steps back to then go forward because of the clubs. No disrespect to obviously Doncaster, but I was at Swansea, yeah. and at mm. Sheffield United, are good clubs. And then I went to um, Doncaster, and there again, it was brilliant people there. The owner really loved the club. He's he's top man, and like great people there again. And um, you had a phenomenal time there as well. Like you're in league well, like team of the year. Yeah, well. team of the year. And we literally, honestly, we had like Rob Jones as a centre back. I had 22 assists that year, and then 10 goals. I used to just ping it up in the air. He used to just to head it in and do me a favour, but. Um, I, I then signed for Birmingham. It was a great club. I was thinking I can be closer to home again. That's originally why I signed for Swansea as well. I was always away from a young age, from like the age of 15, 16. So I wanted to be back home and 
going back to that Swansea move, my parents' house actually got sprayed because I was obviously from Cardiff. They called me like a jack bastard on my mum and dad's house. And I was out with my children one day and this one guy came up to me and goes, you're a fucking disgrace. You are. You play for like Swansea from Cardiff. And I said, oh, what do you do? And he said, oh, I'm a painter and decorator. So I said to him, um, so if you got offered a job, double your wages in Swansea, would you not take it then? Just stay in Cardiff. Just stay in your own postcode. He's like, oh, no, no, I take the job in Swansea. I said, well, there's, there we go. Yeah, it's exactly. my job. It's me putting food on the table for my family. And I want to be close to the home, but that was that. And then Birmingham was another reason why, obviously, it's a great club, big following, close to my family, who my, my kids in Cardiff, so I could travel back and forth. And um, I just enjoyed my time there. I I did really like it. We were, we weren't doing so well when I first signed. Um, but then Gary Rowett then took over from Lee Clark, and that's when we st- really started to, to kick on a bit. Was your relationship with Rowett a key factor for your form there? Because he said, um, you had non-stop great things to say about yourself. Even when not on song, he has that magic to affect a game, change it with a moment of quality. He was obviously very big fan of yourself. Was that relationship a big factor for you settling there as well and hitting the ground running? I think so, yeah. I just think that he knew what my lifestyle was like off the pitch. And he just I think he's the manager who managed me the best. So he knew that I'd be going out getting pissed all the time and blah, blah, blah. But it's kind of like as long as you perform on the pitch, that was the main factor um and he just got me as a person really a a lot of banter with him and things were going really really well we were like three points off um second place i think coming towards december time and we played ipswich on a tuesday we beat him one nil we then played rotherham on a four uh on saturday we beat him four two and the owners just went absolute ballistic why are you not beating rotherham like seven eight nil and blah 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 this crazy talk and then he got the sack um and then it was just madness, really. We felt in the dressing room we were probably maybe two signings away of potentially getting promoted to the Premier League. And then we brought Zola in, and I think we won like two games in about 24 games. Yeah, it's just madness. I'm a Wolves fan. And one of those games you won was against Wolves. Yeah. <laughs> Look at pictures of Zola celebrating there. It still haunts me. Yeah. Haunts me. <laughs> um, moving on a little bit from Birmingham, um, how, did the, how did the move to, to India come about? How, how, how was that? Set? Fascinated by this. Yeah, so I, um, what happened was I was, when I was leaving Birmingham, Ips, uh, Mick McCarthy rang me and he said, look, come and join me at Ipswich for till the end of the season for six, seven months, wherever it might be. And I just got to the age where I wanted to try a new culture. Um, I always wanted to play abroad. And in my head, I was thinking I wanted to go to China because that's where all the money and all the <laughs> yeah. players are floating about. Um, so I wanted to go there, but then India come knocking and I just thought, you know what, let's just try something new. I didn't want to, like, the championship is a grind. Like, Saturday, Tuesday, Saturday, Tuesday, Saturday, Tuesday. It takes its toll. And um, I just wanted to experience something different. So, obviously, I knew Robbie Keane was at the same team that I was going to. Teddy Sheridan was a manager. And so I thought, right, let's just go and have a, have a crack at it. And then that's, that was it. What's your experience, like, with the fans and the culture around football there? It's, obviously, we don't see a lot of like, the Indian uh, League on the telly over here. So what was it? What was the culture around football like? Were the fans really passionate as well? Or? The main sport is obviously cricket. So yeah. when we were playing, it was we'd be in a huge stadium. We'd get not like a, a huge amount of following, to be quite honest. Um, but we weren't doing particularly well as well. It was quite crazy because the standard football you'd get, obviously you'd have like Robbie Keane, who's played at, you know, he's a legend of the Premier League. He's we had a Ryan Taylor who's played at Newcastle as well, the the right back, and he was my teammate at Wigan as well. So he's got an absolute wand of a right foot. And um, but then you'd have literally like five or six players, homegrown players, like you just picked them off at the street. Like you'd be passing the ball, their foot would be going over the ball, going out of play. The goalkeepers literally would you'd have to put their hands in the go- in the gloves because they didn't have them in there by the looks of it. And it was just all it was just crazy standard. So you go from like obviously Robbie Keane to then you know, someone who you just picked up off the street really to play football with. And um, it, the standard wasn't great. That must have an effect on your own form then, obviously. Like when, you, when you're surrounded by good players, you play well yourself then. So obviously, when you're giving the ball to somebody, you're not confident it's going to be able to keep it in play. That must then make your decision making on the pitch a, yeah. lot, a lot different because you're thinking, I'm not squaring it to this lad because it's going into the stands. So. Well, yeah, when he used to go back to the goalkeeper, we were thinking, fuck it, anything would happen. <laughs> because the keeper wasn't really that tall either. We were just like, th- do you know when you just play as a kid, you're thinking, right, hit the ball as high as you can. It's got a chance of going in because the keeper is small. That's what it was like. It was taking me back to when I was six or seven. Would you recommend more players to try it like overseas, try playing? It seems to be a culture of quite a few up-and-comers that don't, really travel across overseas to to prove themselves or just to like you said like a change of culture even do you think more players should be doing that 
you th- did you find it integral to for you for your headspace even um it wasn't good for me mentally really because my wife at the time was due pregnant and she couldn't fly with me late on because it showed on the scan that her placenta was too low so she couldn't come over and i wasn't in a good place mentally anyway my drinking was through the roof and i was literally in a dark place and i and me then going over to india and it's a culture shock really when you go there um because you'd be literally we were staying in like a, a five-star hotel and literally you know 10 yards down the road you got someone no light washing in a ditch um naked on the street with a bucket and it's just like crazy um so for me personally it wasn't a good headspace but any youngsters i'd recommend them probably staying more european you know when you got like sancho and and obviously juba and them just recently gone they go into good clubs like dortmund they learn their trade the right way i think if you're going to do it the right way then stay in stay in europe to then eventually come back to the premier league or play in play in the highest leagues but for me it was kind of like i was looking at retirement i was playing maybe going two three years then retire is that the place where you thought okay let's think differently i need a different approach like going from there because you didn't like you didn't spend too long in india did you no, so what happened was I actually, I went there and I got injured. Um, but because they're only allowed a certain amount of overseas players, foreigners, um, he said, look, right, you've played games, you're not going to play because we had four games left. I wasn't going to make it for those games. So they literally paid the rest of my contract up and then I come home. Um, but the season was short anyway. I was only going over there for literally two or three months. Are we going to talk a little bit about mental health? You retired at the age of 30 in 2018. Uh, could you explain what the what that was about how come you decided to make that decision um i think for a number of years i was drinking very heavily but i didn't let like my teammates and management staff be like oh yeah he loves a night out and and even like my agent you know i I was always have clubs interested in signing me but like oh he's a party boy he loves a night out but i think people don't really jump on that i think right he's got an addiction or he's got a problem or he's got mental health problems hence why he's drinking a lot um i think they just initially think oh, he's a party boy we don't want that kind of character in in the group really um and so I, I was drinking really really heavily um in my late 20s it was like a number of times three or four times occasions where i try and I'd, I'd drink i'd try and take my own life but it was then getting to the point even when i was sober i was still planning to take my own life i was you know i was spending many days in bed and my wife at the time was be the only person who knew that i was in in a pickle really um and then towards the back end of my career especially when i was retiring i was just fed up with the politics really especially at birmingham towards the end i i loved my time with gary rower and the club then um but then i did so much and i was negotiating a new contract for four months with him then zola came in i was negotiating a new contract with him he said look i definitely want to keep you blah blah and then january the last day of the transfer window he was like he rung me up i was i was in my house and he just said, um, you need to leave as soon as possible. Otherwise, I'm going to make your life a hell to stay here. You're going to be trained on your own. You're going to be away from the group. You're going to be trained at different times, blah, blah, blah. And that's when I thought, that's not really him because he's a really, really nice guy. Um, but I didn't tell him he was a nice guy on the t- phone. I just told him he's a fucking asshole and put the phone down. But then when I saw, so I then went to Bristol City. I still wanted a good place there. And I just thought, right, come on, let's try and pick up again. Um wicked club good people there again because obviously I, I spent my um youth days coming through there and um yeah when i when i left there and went back to birmingham harry redknapp came in i was then made to train on my own a little bit for a while and then i was put back in the team and it was literally just like ups and downs there's so much politics involved and i and i thought that's some of the players that were getting brought in i knew that were not better than me and going to improve the squad um and I, then when I was getting thrown out that way for politics reasons, because I knew that the owner was trying to get rid of all of Gary Rowett's players and, and so on. Um, and I remember Steve Cottrell saying to me, he's like, look, I did have your name on the team sheet a few times because we've bumped into each other a couple of times since then. He's like, look, I just got told just to take players' names off. So they, they eventually, strong characters like him were getting dictated to who to play. And then Zola rung me up after he got the sack as well. And he apologized and, you know, he's a, he's a really, really nice guy. And um, he just said, look, that, that wasn't me making those decisions because I was told I was going to take control and eventually it didn't happen, blah, blah, blah. And um, that's when I just fell out of love for the game, really, with the politics because I really love playing for Birmingham. I, I, you know, it's a wicked club. The fans are brilliant. My teammates were good. 
Um, and I love spending time being there. It was just unfortunately just ended on a little bit of a sour note just because I didn't want to leave. I was negotiating a new contract. I would have loved to have probably finished my career there. Um, but it just didn't go well. And then off, off the pitch, I was, in, I was in a dark place and I was not really speaking to anyone about it for, for a long period of time because I didn't want to jeopardize, again, food on the table for my kids. I didn't want to jeopardize my place in the football club or the team. And I don't know if there's many managers out there Maybe there are at the moment where you could go to him and say, by the way, I'm struggling, but I still need to play. Um, because that was the only time that I felt free was playing on a Saturday. So when that was taken away from me, I was, I was finding it quite difficult. So it's fascinating to, to find out how much uh, clubs actually have an impact on where you play, how you play. Like if they want you out, they'll just find a way to get you out. So it, you said it has an impact on your mental health and well-being. Do you think if you came came out more with saying that, like, I'm struggling with mental health, that would have had an impact on where you were sent, or would you did you hide it, knowing that it could have a, a negative impact on your career? Um, no, because I went to when I went to Bristol City, it was it was a good club as well. They were, you know, um, they did things the right way there, so I thought it was a it was a decent move for me. Still in the championship. So I didn't really see that as a backward step because I knew that they were progressing really well. Um, but in terms of, because I was doing so well for Birmingham and I felt that I was sacrificing a lot, you know, part of my, part of my cartilage came away with my knee. I was getting injections. I was taking painkillers like most footballers do. They just take painkillers just to be out there on a training pitch. So I was sacrificing, like all of the players, they sacrifice a lot to, to play. And I was really enjoying my time at Birmingham. Just um, in terms of, of that I my drinking was through the roof um and I just feel that sometimes players need a lot more support um because if they are drinking a lot there's a reason for it you know I I there'd be times sometimes I'd, I'd be stinking of alcohol and I'd be stay uh, I'd be kept in inside just a, a second day recovery blah 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 but it wasn't it was just because they knew that they needed me then for the next game so I, I was performing well so it was just all about how you perform on the pitch rather than you as a human being off it. Um, so so when you see footballers or, yeah, he's playing out his contract, he's doing this, he's doing that, there's a reason. It's because he's getting treated like a fucking idiot and he's made to train on his own because there's no other working environment that I can think of. You know, say, for example, you're working in Tesco's, you don't stack the shelves properly. You don't go, oh, by the way, you haven't stacked the shelves today. Go and work on your own for three weeks. It don't happen. Mm. Do you feel like this is happening uh, with, with Gareth Bale now at Real Madrid? And do you after stepping back from the game a little bit more, do you see players even more as commodities now? Yeah, you're just on a... I, I think in the Bale instance is that I don't think that he gets the respect that he deserves. Like I just don't I just don't understand it because he's a very humble guy. I've known him, obviously I've been in the, the youth set up with him with Wales, I've been in the first team set up with him for like over 10 years. And I don't see a guy who's going to be causing problems at all. He's very humble. He's very down to earth. He's he's a good person. Um, and he's gone there and won four Champions Leagues. And he's delivered at yeah. the highest stage. And it's not exactly he's played, won four Champions Leagues and not been involved. He's pretty much been influential on big games. And then his record's better than Zidane and then Brazilian Ronaldo. And I just think that he's getting treated in the wrong way. And again, you just... He's probably been made as a scapegoat. Do you think that's coming from Zidane or the higher powers at Real Madrid? I have no idea. Um, I literally wouldn't even want to guess that. I think if, I just know that he's obviously been like any. I seen Jamie O'Hara's thing on Talksport the other day, and he just said, "Look, at any other football club, he'd be regarded as, as a legend." And he's right. He, yeah, uh, fully uh, at United, if he scores those goals and they win four Champions League, you're a legend forever. But there, I just think that um, even Zidane and Ronaldo used to get abused there. It's just, it's just the way it is. Maybe they'll look back in you know ten years time and give him the respect that he needs. But in this sense, it's just kind of like we'll just let the guy enjoy his football. It's a different culture in it. There, you know, you've got Cristiano Ronaldo. You know, everything he did for Real Madrid, and he got booed. It's like, what do you want? It almost feels with Gareth Bale as if he's being treated badly because of the size of a contract that they decided to offer him. It's like he didn't he didn't pick that figure himself. You offered him that contract. Yeah, I just yes. I just think it's just quite crazy of how the media publicise things. I think I did an interview a few months ago and um they were saying, Oh, you know, Bale can't speak Spanish. But when we used to go away, he used to bring the Real Madrid Masur over and they used to speak Spanish to each other. Mm. Um 
And then you go on the media and John Tarshak's like, well, the Real Madrid fans don't like him because he's not speaking Spanish. And I just think, well, you're not fucking living with him. How do you know? Yeah. So I've never got that as well, because Aguero can't speak English, but you never hear anyone saying about that. You know, he can't he can't speak English at all. It's so what difference does that make? It's quite do you know what? When um Pochettino was Pochettino when he was at Southampton literally mm. did every interview in um with the translator. Uh, yeah, with the translator, sorry. And I'd speak to a couple of my teammates who well two ex teammates or mates of mine at Southampton, like, yeah, he speaks perfect English. Yeah. So obviously don't believe for always what you see. Yeah. So you're saying about uh, alcohol being impactful on your on your career up to date. Um, what do you think the first steps for any one playing the game or anyone like anyone who's struggling with alcohol? What do you think the initial steps are to get over that? Firstly, I think is to admit that you're powerless over a drug and you're powerless over because no one can can beat alcohol ever. Like you're eventually going to get caught up with you. I think that's what you need to do. You initially need to know that you're powerless over then then ask for help um which i remember i was working away in new jersey in new york actually and i said to one of my friends over there when i was working i said oh look how do i what what am i like after a few drinks he's like you're just totally fucking different you just honestly i was a maniac and um i was like, i'm gonna check into rehab when i get home and he just like looked at me saying really i was like yeah and i knew from that point that was gonna be my last drink and as soon as i got back i called um, sport and chance and I just said look check me in as soon as possible so that's when I checked into rehab it's incredible but I think so, sorry to interrupt no, you but I think it. I think personally to do with mental health obviously when you're in a dark place with depression and anxiety and you're having all these things but I think it's quite similar with an addiction unless you want it for yourself to get better no one else is going to do it for you you can have like my wife at the time was telling me look you need to stop drinking you need to get help but because I didn't give a fuck and I wasn't listening but the only time that I then listened to get help was when I spoke to myself, right, you need to sort your shit out. So I think you need to want it for yourself. So you give regular updates about how long you've been sober now on uh, social media platforms. Um, how many people reach out to you? Loads, like loads and loads every single day. I think um, with all different addictions, all different ages, um, it's quite sad really when I get you know younger people message and they're in an environment where they can't speak to their parents because they've either got an addiction or they're the ones who's actually causing the mental health problems on their ch on the children themselves and they don't know where to reach i think that's the most difficult part is that they don't know where to go and there's not enough support maybe for the children so um that's part of the reason why i set my own foundation up and that's the reason why i've joined um businesses with a, a psychotherapist who's a good friend of mine why we brought these online courses out because i feel that even if you can't reach out to speak to someone personally you can then do an online course or read up about your anxiety what can get me better your depression so that's hence why i've gotten gone into that field because i don't want to just target um people who have really really good jobs and they're successful sports people i want to actually reach people who don't have the the help that they need you know just normal working people how much would you know someone when you when you needed some you know help how much would like how open you are now with speaking about it if you had had someone there at the time speaking about it as well to you how much would that have helped you um yeah i think it would be i don't i don't um I can't really remember anyone talking like that, though. I think only recent times that it's, it's actually happened. I think I remember when the PFA used to come in, we used to have like slideshows and we used to spend more time about what referees were doing than we would talk about mental health. Mm. Mental health was never an issue. Racism was never really spoken about that much. And it blows my mind, really, because when you if you even look at the racism, what's going on, that's... All the of big course. issues then, like yeah, homophobia, course, racism, yeah, exactly. of mental course. health, huge. Of course, if you're, if you're racially abusing someone, that's causing major mental health problems. Yeah. It's just, just mind-blowing. You mentioned the PFA there. When retiring, um, you were very critical of them um, for not doing enough to tackle mental health issues and opted uh, seeking your own counsel uh, rather than via the PFA support. Um, are you aware if they've made any strides to offer more support over the past couple of years or did they reach out to you after you made these comments? No, they didn't actually. Uh, one, probably in a negative way, I think one of the, the people there um, said, oh yeah, we tried reaching out to David and blah, blah, blah. They didn't. Um, <laughs> and even when I retire, even when players retire, what I don't, I'm not expecting like a red carpet uh, or anything by any stretch of the imagination. I didn't win Premier Leagues, I didn't win Champions League, but I thought, you know, I've had a decent career. Most players out there, even if you 
if you made it as a professional and like you should have an email off the PFA saying, Oh, congratulations on yeah. what your career, but like, you don't even have that. Um <laughs> And so it's quite mind boggling that a lot of senior players who have played in like Premier League, played international football, that they still continue to ring me up and they don't even know what the PFA do themselves. So it's, it's <laughs> which you should know because you're part of that. Um, they should be the PFA are there to look after the players, their, their well being. And I think there are very good people in the organization who are trying to bring fresh ideas. I just think that it needs changing from top to bottom. There's, there's too many dinosaurs in there with old, um, you know. A thought process about the football, about football, and uh, human beings really. Yeah, the game's moved on. Massively. The impact that they could have would be absolutely incredible if they got it all to get a got a system in place to help actually help players and address some issues. Yeah, I think it, they should, and and there are some guys there and who are trying to look, move things forward. Who've got brilliant ideas. It's just maybe if they've been if they've got someone who's pulling them back and they can't put their their stamp on things, it's really difficult for them. But there are really really good people in the organization. Um, I'm just saying that overall, not many people know exactly what they're doing, and and you know, players just just put that behind them because it's not support players when they retire. Because most players that they don't know what they're going to do when they retire because they think, well, we all think that we're going to last forever playing football. We dreamt about playing football as a young boy. We're going to do this and do that, but you know, nothing prepares you for for outer life really. Yeah, we um last year we spoke to or this early this year. This year's gone on for so long. Uh, a guy called Rodri Jones, who was signed by Ferguson at United in the youth team. And he struggled hugely with mental health. And he spoke to us in depth about how he was like, there was just no support. And in the end, he just broke down in, in the manager's office. And it's just like, I, I, I don't know what I'm doing. And he said then, he was like, the lack of support that you get, he was like, it's massively disappointing. And he ended up walking away from the game really young. You know, I think he was about 24, 25 like that when he left. Yeah, I just think that even, you know, from a young age, we're always thinking about, right, we're focused on the next, you know, superstar coming through, blah, blah, blah. But what about all these millions and millions of kids who are getting actually released? We're not really yeah. thinking about, right, they're being brought through the, the professional environment and you, you tip to be the boy wonder. And the next thing you know, you've got a normal job. Not that yeah. there's nothing wrong with that, but people like to see people failing. So yeah. when they got like a normal, you're like, oh, well, you're the same as me now. You're not making the professional football. You're a failure. So they got all that pressure of them being released with no plan B. Yeah. So there's no education. So that's why I like the American, the American system where they put them through college with, you know, in like basketball yeah. or American football, they always got an education at the fullback on, which I think we should maybe look to be following a lot more rather than just letting guys just be released. Or even when they retire as well, when they're later on, we always think that we got our shit in place. But we, do you know what? When I first retired, I didn't even know how to get on the train on and off. <laughs> no I had to get a ticket I had to ring my wife at the time how the fuck do you get out of this station <laughs> because I was so used to like when we used to travel we used to have security guards used to take us on the train give us our tickets when we used to fly we used to have like the bus pulled up on the, the runway they would carry our passports our suitcase would get delivered to the hotel rooms we never used to do anything Yeah. Wow. so I didn't know normal life skills really and I was like 30 learning everything at such a by the way stage. that's my fault i should know <laughs> i should know how to get on a train on and off but i'm just saying in general is that you know i was nearly thick as shit <laughs> um you said at this time that if managers found out players have mental health issues they might use it as a weapon uh not to play them um did you experience this during your career at all not me personally, but to be honest, like back in the day when you, I was coming through the ranks, at like really young, you'd be like, oh, he's he's mentally weak or he's mentally this. Not personally, maybe about me, but other players, you hear mm. that. And sometimes you just think, well, now looking back, well, maybe that guy did actually need help. Yeah. Um, so I think you, no one really knows. But I think with, with that question, I, I don't think... I would love to know the amount of players who's gone to see a manager and say, look, well, I'm actually mentally struggling, but I still want to play. And they have their full manager support. Mm. Um, I doubt there's, there's many. No, no, it's sad. Um, do you think football's becoming more accepting of these issues though, by and large? A little bit, but not huge. I think we like to portray that football's moving in the right dire direction a lot quicker than it, than it actually is. But I think there's too many tick box exercises going on in, in every organization, not just football. I think it's just in general work in society. I think we like, oh, right, we covered this basis. We got the, the basic support and that's yeah. it. And then that's how we cover it. But I think in football, what the actual organizations and the, the money that's involved, especially at the elite level, I think this should be a, you know, way more support. Well, there must be, there's, there's so much money in the game now. It's just like, well, 
you know, there should be loads of support there available to everybody, you know, from every level. It, we've seen a lot recently. There's little things, you know, like United announcing that they're not going to be releasing any youth team players because of COVID. We're not going to release any. So they've all been kept on at the club. And I think that's a massive step forward. But yeah, you're right. There's not enough that's been done. Yeah, I think there's, there's a, well, every time I do these podcasts and interviews and stuff, there's one club that really st uh, stuck out for me is that when I went to Wolves, I went there as well. And they do things like really, really well where they, you know, so one or two days a week, they'll educate the, the youth team players about like social media. Hmm. Then they educate them about money. Then they educate them about bullying. Then they educate them about mental health problems. So they're, they're covering every basis of when they leave the professional game, which I think that's really, really important. So more clubs that are doing that, the better. Hmm. That's great. I didn't know that about Wolves. To, to lay that in to actually provide some life skills and you don't know how long your career is going to last even if you get to that stage everyone forgets that it takes a lot of time that like takes so much effort to get to that stage of being even like semi-professional professional and everyone seems to forget that yeah i think there's so much that's why i hate i hate that terminology of oh he's an overnight success I hate that because say for example messi he's an overnight success at 17 no he's not he's been literally working his balls off for the last 11 12 years you didn't see him daily kicking a ball and the sacrifice that he'd made so it takes a long time to to get to that level and it's been a huge sacrifice and, and practice to, to be a professional you touched um when you talk about wolves then on social media um do you think obviously that platform you use it to talk about your foundation and um people to reach out to you but do you think that's that social media has also had like a big negative impact because fans are a lot closer to players now a player can tweet something and then a fan it could just be streams of abuse underneath do you think that's been a big factor for the reason that the stigma hasn't changed as much and why maybe more players are struggling with with mental health yeah i think you just get a fucking idiots then you get to like keyboard warriors on on social media which you know what actually i i posted something the other day and when the news come out about the kids going back to school so i obviously got three kids so i posted on um on instagram of it's me doing like a funny dance when i was playing football i think i scored a goal so i said oh this is me when the kids are going back to school so i post that on social media then everyone's literally tagging me and jimmy savile in the same thing and it's just like i was going to respond to it, i just thought oh is this how we got to these days where you just got that fucking bollocks going on but i think after like football matches is that you just see it straight away and you and the the madness is that when you're seeing like players that you've played with or top players and they're just getting literally abused, you're just thinking, wow. And the thing is, is that when you go into any local pub or anywhere, everyone's a football manager. Everyone's yeah. everyone's had a trial somewhere. Everyone's played had trials for a couple of weeks, or my my nephew or my niece has gone trials, blah 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 blah. And um or I could have made a professional. Well, why didn't you then? Yeah. That, like Chris Wilder said the same thing a few weeks ago. Yeah, exactly that. Brilliant. It's just like, well, well, why didn't you then? You didn't because you didn't make the sacrifices. But it's just mad, really, that everyone thinks they should have made it, but you didn't. I wouldn't want to piss off Wilder either. I know. I just, when he, yeah, he seems like a nice, genuine guy. And I know, I know, like, a lot of guys that play for him, they love him. So, um, and when he came out with that, I loved it. <laughs> do, you, do you think it's not, it's knowing, not, not knowing what to say to you? Like, because obviously, like, I coveted, like, a Welsh international player. Do you think people in pubs just freeze up and don't know what to say and then talk some shit to you? Honestly, in my drinking days when I used to go out to a nightclub and people come up to me talking about football, you think, "Fucking put the ball away! I'm out here to get steaming. <laughs> I don't want to be, you know, kicking a ball around. I've been doing that all day." Um, but I think it's that you know, initially, you know, when fans are engaging and they want photos with you, you know, that's fine. I, I didn't have no, obviously, no problems with that, and. Um, but I think it's just maybe just opening up a conversation, isn't it? Really, just to, that's maybe their way in, and that's what they love. That's that's what part of the game is all about. You know, mm. fans are getting to be be with their, their idols. Do you think they forget you're you're a human being as well? Like yeah, I think that's that's a huge point because when um, I post some things about you know mental health and, and you get like stupid quotes saying, "Well, I would I train on my own," or "I'd be feeling that certain way if I was on forty grand a week," and I just think, well. You know, money doesn't solve everything in terms of what's going on in your mind. And I think the thing is, is that there's a huge stigma surrounding athletes, especially football, because when you look at Robbie Williams, who took his own life to do to do with mental health, everyone's like, great guy, funny guy, lovely guy, um, one of my favorite people. But then if that was a footballer, it's kind of like, 
Pope Willie was on 40 grand a week. But I just think, well, Robin Williams has got way more money than footballers, but yeah. you didn't get, it's not the same. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the comment about, you know, oh, you're on X amount of money, it's always driven me mad because it's like they're only paid a very small percentage of what that club makes. Yeah. You know, it's like, you know, we talked about Gareth Bale and the wages that Gareth Bale's on was irrelevant because he's earned those wages because throughout his career, he deserved those because that's what Real Madrid decided to give him. And it's nowhere near the amount of money that the people who sign Gareth Bale's checks, how much they make. Do you know what? I watched, um, we were talking before we come on here, the last dance and something struck me with Dennis Rodman, what he said. And, and he was like saying, well, 10% 10, 10 of my wages are probably on my ability, but the 90% is for literally the bullshit that I have to deal with off the court. I don't know if that was the right percentage, what he said, but someone along those lines. Yeah. And he's so right because... Mm. Gareth Bale's on those wages because he can't fucking leave his house without someone following him and yeah. not everyone else has got that pressure on him. Like, he can't go anywhere and, and this and that. And obviously, his ability is, he's, he's a freak. He's obviously an unbelievable player, but I think it, as well with the, the other crap that he has to deal with, you get paid that amount of money to, to be, you know, the whole reason to do with that. Yeah. You, you touched on um, the David Cottrell Foundation, which was launched last year. Um, it's a fantastic quote and mission statement which greets you on the homepage. Um, it says, after suffering from mental health issues from an early age, I want to support others who are suffering out there and feel they don't have a safe place to talk. Um, how's the response been since you since you've launched the foundation? Yeah, it's been really, really good. Um, I think initially with, obviously, um, I had a lot of bad press in terms of um, a newspaper article last year. And I think some people are really skeptical about like when people start their own charity, are they doing it for the right reasons, this and that. Um, but we actually do everything for free. We, we put on mental health anonymous meetings where we basically have a coffee shop where people come and share and talk and listen of their own experiences of how, what they're doing with mental health. Um, and it's just like a safe environment. I think what we do behind the scenes, we've given so much to people where they didn't think that they wanted to continue in life. Um, and we we do a lot of good things. It, it's, it, we're obviously still growing as well. We still want to keep Im implementing more um, support for, for individuals and as much as we can. And, and that's what we're trying to do. We, we work extremely hard every day to make sure that we can provide the best support for people. So as we find out more and more, mental health doesn't, you don't necessarily know if someone's struggling with, with mental health. You've got a huge task ahead. What's the best way to educate people about mental health generally, especially about, uh, like we've spoken about suicide as well, uh, suicide prevention day, I think it has happened recently. What, where, where would you begin? Because it's such a wide spectrum. And like you said, you don't know if someone's suffering with mental health of any sort, like we've got a numerous amount. So where do you start with the foundation? Um, I think what I always think is that not every disability is visible. I think, um, you know, a lot of people have troubles that we don't know. And I, the thing is, is that I don't uh, try and say to people, oh, by the way, I'm a fucking angel. I've done, like, my life's been perfect, blah, blah, blah. I've made huge mistakes. I've spoken to people like shit. I've caused problems to people. But I now have turned the corner to try and be the, a better person. So what I'm trying to say is that when you come across people, try and just be as kind as you can because you don't understand how much that can affect that person. Um and I think that's what I try and do on a daily basis. I think, um, again, I'm not an a, I'm not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but I just think we just have to make sure that we try and be careful about how we how we say things or treat others because we don't understand what they're going through at home. Okay, so Wales and everyone's favourite summer, 2016. Um, when that draw initially came out for the qualifiers, it was Belgium, Bosnia, Israel, Cyprus, Andorra. How confident were you in the setup that, Something, something, something could happen here. I think for a previous a, a period of time, we felt that something was special going to happen. It was only a matter of time because I think that we were so close as a group. Not only did we have a brilliant management staff in the sense of how we were organised going onto the pitch, and our philosophy, and but off the pitch we were so close. Um, and I think we we always wanted the best for each other. I think that's the only time that I've been in a squad and I've been on the bench and I've wanted the team to win. Normally I'm like, fuck, I hope you lose and all I can come on and score. And so we win that way. But when with Wales, I thought, you know what? I hope we win every time, even if I was playing or not playing. Um, so that just probably proves how close we, we were because yeah. most footballers 
maybe you know they think the same as me um in that aspect so um but yeah it was amazing I, and i thought that we had a great chance but it helps when you have you know bale and ramsey on your team who are probably arguably the you know the best welsh players we we've had so when you have that and then we have like a good core and everyone was playing at a good level championship or the premier league we felt like we could we could do something special you mentioned coming off the bench and scoring and at the time you're in good form for birmingham simon church goes down cookie gives you the nod and you come on, score a massive goal for us in the qualifier. How was that in front of the red wall, scoring? That must have been incredible. Do you know what? It's not until now that I think, when I talk about it, that I felt it was, I didn't feel like it was a huge goal at the time. I think it's because with a competitive edge of all of us, when we're playing, we always go out to win every match. So it's just kind of like, right, we just win that match and then just move on to the next. But now looking back, it was a huge win for us. But... I was just happy just to be part of the group and to contribute because I always wanted to play for Wales. I always wanted to go to a, a major tournament with obviously um, my country. So to do that and play a part was huge. Um, but I think it was just a sacrifice that all the, the squad and the players made all over the years to eventually get to that level um, was obviously amazing. Once you once you qualified, expectations slightly changed a bit then. Was there anything in the setup of what could be done at the actual tournament then, like where, where you thought you could go or did it stay quite grounded? Um, I think everyone was pretty, you know, pretty grounded. I think it was, I think from a playing point of view in terms of how we were um, structured, how we were managed to perform on the pitch, I don't think the management staff could do any more. Um, you know, we, we play against Portugal, they were well organised. Another day, if we, we didn't perform extremely well there, but if we maybe at the levels that we were against Belgium, I think we, probably would be sitting here saying we made the final um but we ran really really far um yeah i don't think we could have done any more really you said about the the management structure as you progress through that tournament how did chris coleman and the management structure how did they keep you grounded because you know speaking for all of us here we certainly weren't grounded <laughs> like watching it it was do you know what we are really um we are really secluded so we were literally in the middle of nowhere and um, it was just us, really. So we didn't obviously hear the noise back home. We weren't getting sent many videos, blah, blah. So, But every time we were winning a game and progressing, we were getting sent, they were getting shown what was going on back home. Mm. And um, I remember when we, we sat down and we had videos from all back home and, you know, all the families were coming mm. on, like the video recorder saying, oh, I'm proud of you, daddy, or to obviously off the kids, blah, blah. And um, so mine come and it was my one of my close friends, he was laying in bed and he was just like saying, fucking any danger of cookie putting you on the pitch or whatever. <laughs> and we come out in the meeting room and all the lads were like, honestly, we needed your friend to say that because obviously when you haven't seen your kids and they're proud of you, mm. like some of the lads were getting a little bit worse, like, you know, teary and, and obviously back home of obviously how proud they were of us. And then my friends just literally laying in bed. He had the hairiest chest ever. He goes, when's fucking Cookie going to play you? <laughs> and uh, so that made the room like um, chuckle a little bit. But I think we needed that. And we're just like so close. I think um, everyone wanted the best for each other. I think, and I just, I don't know, maybe I'm a little bit biased, but when I'm watching the, the Welsh team now, it's just kind of, I don't know whether, like obviously they're really close and they're doing really, really well and whatever. I just think that, that that year 2016 and before that was just like really had like a special vibe about it it was really special that you mm. could feel it it was it was special watching it it was so special that my wife hates football she watched every second of it and has watched it since she's <laughs> i think um yeah it was just it was just amazing i just remember as well we were at the after party we obviously celebrated look we were disappointed we didn't make it to the final because we all we got to the semi final, we wanted to win the tournament. Mm. Never would have thought we were going into that. Thought, oh, by the way, we're going to win the tournament. Um, but then we went to we went to this nightclub, and I remember right. We walked in there. Two people are in there in middle of nowhere. Denard, I think, yeah, Denard. And um, we've gone in there. It didn't it? Didn't start well because one of the players, I'll name his name. He's he's lifted some fan up. They dropped the floor because there's steam and slopped on the floor. I thought, fuck, here we go. <laughs> Next thing you know, the club's literally just fully loaded, and all I'm seeing is like um, snorkels flying through the air, um, armbands for swimming, all this like swimming gear that's like coming in. We were absolutely steaming, and the club was then it was empty. It's gone from two people, one some guy getting dunked to the floor by someone messing around to like literally the club just could not move. <laughs> so um, we had a lot of memories off the pitch as well. Guesses on who that was? 
<laughs> you actually would not guess it. Disorders. <laughs> Dino, come out. Dino is the one getting done. <laughs> um, so yeah, you you say about yeah the excitement. Like, were there any watching it from back home and seeing how the crowds were? In, was there anything that you saw like the fans? Anything that the fans do because the support that you know the Welsh support that went out there was extraordinary. I tell you what was crazy. We we actually. Before we had the games, we'd always go for a walk. And we went for a walk, the one, I think it was before the quarterfinals or, or whatever it was, and the amount of fans that were literally around us, it was like we were walking through like literally a red wall. Mm. And um, that was quite surreal because um, probably Bale and Ramsey are probably the only, the only ones who are used to that level. Mm. I, th- I wouldn't even say Ramsey maybe was at, at Arsenal at that level because obviously Real Madrid is just next level. But... Mm. Um, yeah, I think it was just just mad, really. And then when we come back home, we then realised we did. There was a special time because the reception we had from the fans was amazing. That was brilliant. When uh, when Robson Carney scored that goal, like, what was it like to be sat there watching that go in? Because I I lost my shit. I think everyone did. I, yeah. To be fair, it was mad. I mean, Churchy were on the side because me, Churchy, and how we'd spend a lot of time um, in each other's rooms and and chill together. And and Churchy and and Hal are, are really close mates. I mean, and there was talks of Hal going to Qatar or something, got mm. written silly amounts of money, and then we were just like giggling on the side and saying, well, I think he's just um, taking his wages up at <laughs> not shutting. Um, but yeah, we were just pleased, pleased for everyone and, and pleased for him because, um, you know, you, you just want your mates to do well. So it was nice to see. It was just yeah. iconic. It's iconic to this day. If anyone reposts it on, on Twitter or anything, it just, it just relights. The, the, the feeling of watching it for there and then is just incredible to see that yeah. whole tournament but that that game especially yeah that game was just that was magic that game i think it's just because obviously belgium at, at the time as well they've got all these superstar players like de bruyne and and hazard but we always used to look at opposition teams and just think Do you know what well we got bail really and we used to think well on the op- at that time as well we would look at the belgian players and we were thinking well no one's performing at the level that he is so why are we going into these games fearful so we didn't really i can only speak for myself but i can't really remember any any of us really thinking oh we're gonna go out there we're gonna be in a you know in a pickle here we just had like good vibes about us we went into every game comfortable that we deserve to be at that level and we can we can compete with the best teams and that's what we showed that we we could do yeah um, moving forward a little bit, you've come out of retirement. I'd play for Barry Town. Um, what convinced you to start playing again? Was there any one particular moment where you thought, "I'm feeling it again"? Well, I was going to, I was going to the. I never thought I was going to play again. I was done with it completely. I never. I had offers to go into the to full time, um, probably for over a year after retirement. I had, you know, I had League One, League Two teams ringing me up, you know, do you want to fancy give her another go, blah, blah, blah. And I just didn't wasn't it, didn't want it. Um, and I kept on bumping into um Gavin Chesterfield, obviously the Barry Town manager at the gym on a regular basis. Like, look, you're looking in good shape. Like you're 30, you've always been fit, blah, blah, blah. And I thought So I said no to him for about seven, eight months. Mm. And then he said, Look, just come on a little training session, see what you think. And so I went for a training session. And then I thought I'll just give her another go, um, but I feel I feel like gradually my competitive side has come back out again. I it's always been there anyway because I never go into like even Monopoly. I always want to win. Mm-hmm. Kids, because I have no chance. So uh, <laughs> so I always want to win no matter what. So that's that started to creep back in, and I just thought even if I'm not performing at the level that I I used to be. I can be useful for obviously the club where they want to go and especially like the younger players coming mm. through. So I can, you know, maybe be kind of like some sort of, of mentor, if you like, um, and try and try and help out is not just on the pitch, but offer it as well. Is it, is it help you rediscover a love for the game being there? They always strike me as a club that's got a very, you know, big community feel about them, Barry Town. Yeah, I think, yeah, there's, there's wicked people there. There's obviously they try and do things the right way. There's a good group of lads. And I think that they've, They've helped me um, bring that winning side back out of me and, and just enjoy going to training. Um, obviously, I'm not as young as I used to be. And I do have a lot more aches and pains now, but I, I'm I'm happy just to be out there and I still go into every training session, every game to, to win. So I'll keep going as long as I ha- as long as I have that. And I think you know, there's great people there and we're trying to 
to achieve great things this season as well. There's no reason why we can't. Um, we obviously had a disappointing result in Europe, but we need to dust ourselves off. So there's obviously there's lessons, and then you can only learn from them. So hopefully, we can do something better this year. Yeah, amazing to get there, though. Amazing. I was watching the whole thing. That pitch was something else. How foggy that was. It was so foggy, honestly. I can In the first half, it was so windy. So we were like, right, we're playing against the winds. Hopefully, it might help us in the second half. And then come out in the second half, the fog literally went and they stopped. The wind just stopped. Jesus. And um, yeah, it was just one of those things. We didn't perform at our best levels. And I don't think they were particularly great, but we just didn't, didn't deserve to get anything out of the match. Hmm. All right, we're going to do a uh, quick fire. Quick fire questions. Yeah. Then we're going to do some uh, like sound bites if possible. Okay. We're going to do that. So um, just going to say some things. You're going to say if, well, yeah. self explanatory. Best manager. Um, that's a tough one. Go on. I don't. It's not going to be a quick fire one. Right. As quick as you can. <laughs> but I'm very interested. In terms of man management skills, for me personally, I think I'd go for Gary Rowett just because he got me as a human being more. In terms of how he managed the dressing room, I think I'd go for Chris Coleman because good guy, wicked guy, knew I was like, can't say anything nicer about him. Um, but from a tactical point of view and the way he sets his teams up, I think Brendan Rodgers. Amazing. All right. Okay. Worst manager? Fucking hell, I've had a few of those. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're allowed to list. Um, <laughs> Plenty of time for that one. I'd probably go Kevin Blackwell. Anyone else? Top three? <laughs> top bottom three it's meant to be uh, quick fire yeah know. it's quick fire no, he's throwing like all sorts yeah. okay uh, best play you've played with I'll probably say Bale standard all right, yeah. worst player oh that's a tough one worst player and then worst trainer worst trainer that's quite tough because the thing is you'd have like a few bad trainers but then they just switch it on in the game but then you have training players who then froze when it come to a, a game mm. I love that chef. Like, oh, you're training this week, then training play, and then when you freeze tomorrow, I used to love that. Things are pressure thing. So, best trainer, I I reckon it'd be out of Gary Speed and um, Craig Bellamy. Amazing. Worst trainer, I don't know, because I've come across a few wrong ones. <laughs> <laughs> best opponent you've played against? On the pitch. Yep, or on the pitch. 1v1, I'd probably go Ashley Cole because I was obviously a winger. But um, best player on the pitch, Ronaldinho, I'd probably go for over El Cristiano Ronaldo. Yeah, they're all right. Yeah, they can, yeah, they're they're can play. Chases, yeah. I think we know the answer, but biggest wind-up merchant, merchant, biggest wind-up played with? Biggest one. Dino. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, he's up there. <laughs> There's loads, to be fair. Um, especially in the Welsh squad, I think it's just because we had like such a close group. We we used to have a few um, mad guys there, but good ones. I can't really th think of anyone off the top of my head though. Um, Bale actually likes a little wind up where he, he looks cheeky. He's got like he that does. that old school banter where you tap you on the shoulder and look the other way. I'll throw a sweet at you. So, but I think that's childish. What yeah, it's childish. <laughs> but I think that's what makes him really humble because he's a superstar, but he still acts that way. So I think that's what kind of mm -hmm. makes him who he is. If you could. Pick your dream team. Who would you have played for in your career? And why? Man United, because I'm a Man United supporter. And my men's name's George Best. I'm surprised you haven't thrown that question in there I today. I knew it. Um, <laughs> Told you. So, yeah. Full, my, full name, please. David Reese, George Best. George Best. Cotter. He actually signed my birth certificate, and I met yeah. him once. And um, his wife at the time... He turned around and said, oh, another George Best. And she was like, fucking hell, not another George <laughs> So uh, I'm assuming it was hard. Incredible. I'm assuming it was hard work. I um, <laughs> love it. So for Man United is because I support them, but I've always loved watching Barcelona. So from a footballing point of view, I'd love to play for Barcelona. Mm -hmm. Right. I, that's, that wraps up my, uh, my rapid fire questions. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.